This is the seventh episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. Um, I'm Sean, and this is Evan. And every week we talk about the latest news and developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency community. So uh, some of the biggest stuff that happened this week involves the Bitcoin Foundation, which is a group that has the stated purpose of using their funding and membership dues to support the Bitcoin code and the core infrastructure, but also uh, the stated purpose of spreading Bitcoin adoption, promoting it, um, not just to the public, but also to politicians in government. And uh, there's been some controversy this week over the activities of the director of the foundation. Uh, you you wrote an article earlier this week about how Brock Pierce, the director, has <laughs> released um, a new altcoin. Well, it's not even really an altcoin, right? It's it's actually based on Bitcoin's blockchain, but it attempts yeah. to use um, dollars to back the coin on a one-to-one -one ratio. Is is that about right? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I just want to say that Brock Pierce isn't the director. That was some misinformation I got from Wikipedia when I was writing the article. Huh. Uh, he's on the board of directors, but he's not the director. And I fixed oh, the article. Okay. Huh. But, but yeah, I, I just wanted to clear that up. And yeah, he's he announced that... Um, He's working on developing a new cryptocurrency, which was a, which isn't really a cryptocurrency. It's called RealCoin, and it's just something that's going to be built on top of the blockchain. And it's just uh, it's basically just like a, a system of tokens. You know, like you have one real coin, it's worth one dollar. So it's you know its source of its source of value is from U.S. dollar, and. Um, Really, that's pretty much all there is to it, or that's all that we know right now. Right, um, right. Like all, all of the reserves, everything, you know, all the all the dollars that are like being used in the real coin system, they're going to be recorded by the public ledger, you know, and authenticated by the blockchain. Right. And um, that's like pretty much as far as it goes in terms of you know being a cryptocurrency. Now, what? what like what the goals of this are is to um cut down on the volatility that bitcoin has yeah and to establish a stable exchange rate between cryptocurrency and the dollar because you know um bitcoin and you know the various cryptocurrencies you know one dollar equals point zero 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 whatever you know and um and then the prices are, are always fluctuating right Right, because that's how the free market works, right? It's it's the price is whatever someone's willing to pay for it at the time, and that's why it fluctuates. A lot of people don't even really understand the reason for that, and they're like, "Oh, the yeah. volatility is a horrible thing. We got to fix it. Like it's a pr inherent problem or something." Yeah, there's nothing really wrong with having uh, with having price volatility. It actually could be, um, it you know, it actually could serve as an incentive to get some investors in because they see the huge um, arbitrage opportunities. You know, they can yeah. they can buy low, and then tomorrow the price could jump up a hundred percent, and they make you know huge profit. But it's it the Bitcoin price volatility, its existence, um, it's kind of a problem because it because because of the volatility, Bitcoin isn't really good for um, a unit of account. Like, you know, we measure things mm -hmm. in dollars, like this is two or three dollars. We can't really do that with Bitcoin because we never know what a Bitcoin is worth. You know, it fluctuates so rapidly. But the reason that happens is that it's just not, you know, as anywhere near as widely as, as accepted as the dollar is yet. Yeah. So, you know, as, as people, more people begin to accept it and use it as an everyday currency, you know, that'll go away. And as a consequence, you know, the exchange rate will stabilize because if the if the value is more stable, you know, then it'll be then the Bitcoin to dollar exchange rate will be the same longer. It'll be more stable. Yeah. So these are really just temporary problems, and that's as far as I know from what I could glean from the information that I that I found. Those are really the only the two main selling points of Realcoin. Those are the only two 
uh, problems, Bitcoin problems that RoadCoin um, addresses. So I just don't really see the point of it at all, especially when the person who's heading up this project, his his day job, his, the thing he's like getting paid to do mm -hmm. is to advocate Bitcoin. You know, not something that's supposed to fix Bitcoin, like the Bitcoin or Foundation. With Bitcoin, or yeah, such. or compete with Bitcoin. You know, the Bitcoin Foundation is supposed to fix problems with Bitcoin, not develop alternatives to compete with Bitcoin. And that's pretty much what my article is about. Uh huh. So, like, it, it, it seems kind of like a weird idea to me. Like, I get why they want to do it and the problem, supposed problem it's supposed to address. But so. If 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 more people buy into the real coin system, and real coins like get more valuable, or they would get more valuable as more people want them. I mean, I assume they want people to want this coin. Um, are they just going to add more dollars to their like internal reserves to like match the one to one ratio? Because they they'll have to fluctuate their dollar reserves to keep that amount equal, right? Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna depend on how many people want it, and so. Um... You know, um, they have a certain amount pre-mined. This isn't like, you know, Bitcoin, like proof of work or anything. It's just yeah. like they create them as they need them. Hmm. And um, so as more people put dollars into the system, you know, they'll create more real coins. And um, so really, even if the demand rises, since it has a fixed exchange rate, one real coin uh, equals one dollar, an increased demand isn't really going to increase the value because this value is dependent on the dollar. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how many people want a real coin, one real coin is going to be one dollar. Yeah. So, it, so in reality, since its, main, since its only source of value is the United States dollar, it's actually going to de depreciate over time as the dollar inflates, you know, because huh. we're in the middle of, you know, massive period of inflation because the Federal Reserve is you know, pumping all this stimulus into the economy. Oh, yeah. And so, well, no, um, that, that whole process has barely even begun yet. All these banks have these, uh, you know, massive reserves of free money from the Federal Reserve, but it hasn't even really started trickling down to the rest of the economy yet. Yeah. Once that happens, then you'll really start to see prices yeah, that's, rise. That's yeah, that's what the Keynesians call a liquidity trap. It's when uh, the central bank is pumping money into the system, but it's not getting uh, put into circulation. Mm. And... Um, but if when the uh, when the Fed does it long enough, uh, you know it's going to start having some effect because people because confidence is going to start going back up, and you know we're seeing we're seeing you know over two hundred thousand jobs a month being created right now as a result of uh, QE. So, you know, as as the bubble gets inflated, you know as the as this new uh, inflationary cycle gets underway. Uh, confidence is going to go back up, and yeah, those reserves are going to start hitting the money markets, uh, and the interest rates on those loans are going to be very low. And mm. so, um, yeah. So yeah, anything anybody who deals with real coin, they're not really getting any any of the advantages of cryptocurrency, other than you know the costless uh, the costless transactions and right. the instant transactions and the fact because, that one um, coin is divisible up to you know eight decimal places when in reality the dollar is only divisible up to two decimal yeah. places yeah they don't they don't get that uh the only two things they get out of the cryptocurrency aspect is the instant and uh essentially costless transactions because uh you know since you have since it's backed by the dollar you know there's no there's no like eight decimal points that it can be divisible by it's you know worth a hundred pennies Mm. Uh, so as you know, as the dollar decreases as a result of uh, central banking policies, real coin is going to depreciate too. So it solves two very temporary and very unimportant problems in Bitcoin, uh, and in the long run, it's going to end up being completely worthless. And there's just no point in even doing it. It's a waste of Brock Pierce's time. My opinion is, why doesn't he, you know? spend some of that time and money on his developers so we can you know fix mining centralization yeah. the, the one know? cryptocurrency that the majority of people actually support and actually want to see succeed bitcoin he works for the bitcoin foundation what is he doing making real coin yeah he's he's busy making real coin when 
Bitcoin actually has a very serious problem with uh, mining centralization. And uh, there's no, the foundation, they've assumed the responsibility of being, you know, the organization that develops Bitcoin. Yeah. But they have, you know, they have, you know, three developers and only one of them have been doing anything recently. So it's just, I don't, I don't understand why uh, Brock Pierce is yeah. doing this. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so weird, right? I mean, the the idea behind RealCoin, I can understand it. I've been actually waiting for an altcoin to try and do something like this for a while now. Create a one-to-one ratio with the dollar. Because, you know, that's that's something that, you know, may, uh, Wall Street investors kind of like the idea of. And, and the Wall Street Journal wrote a glowing piece about RealCoin. That's how I first found out about it. And they basically love the idea. They think it's like, oh, it fixed everything wrong with Bitcoin. <laughs> So yeah, I can understand the appeal of RealCoin, and I know why someone was eventually going to make it. But of all people in the whole world, it's got to be Brock Pierce on the board of directors of the Bitcoin Foundation. Not just some yeah, random it's... guy in his basement who wants to make his own altcoin or something. He's like, ooh, a new idea. Like, No, it's the Bitcoin Foundation guy who makes this. Yeah, Which... and he, you know, he, took, he took a pretty big hit on this. Like, a lot of people... Uh... A lot of people are pretty upset, you know, for the same reasons I am. They think he's mm-hmm. wasting his time. He, his job is to promote Bitcoin. You know, why isn't he promoting Bitcoin? And so this just really isn't good for him and the foundation as a whole. One, because people think he's a pedophile. Two, two people, um, he's been accused in the past of, of uh, fraud. Um, yeah. And now he's got this third strike against him. He's, you know, neglecting his duties as um, a board member of, uh, you know, what is considered the main representative of Bitcoin. And he's focusing on this, you know, side project. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, I, I read some of his history and I, you know, got a little summary of the like the pedophile accusations. Like he worked for some, you know, company when he was 18, some tech company. They did like videos online or something and he uh, supposedly he got accused of um of of having in, inappropriate sexual relations with the uh, underage um uh girls who were like in those videos or something yeah. and it's like okay maybe he's immoral maybe he's not but in my opinion that has really like no um no bearing on his current position for the bitcoin foundation it doesn't really matter that much all i want uh, from a potential uh, director of the Bitcoin Foundation is to be, you know, heavily involved in Bitcoin. Like, they should be the most heavily involved person in Bitcoin. Um, but, like, he just came out of nowhere. He hasn't... He's only been involved for, like, a year, a couple of years or something. And, and only from, like, the edges. You know, he's not, like, a, a huge um, insider guy who's been around for a long time and has done a lot of good work for the community. He just kind of came out of nowhere and got elected to the board and it's like he 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 got elected to re, to replace um um first of all Mark Carpolis exited yeah. when Mt. Gox went under and then Charlie Shrem had to exit when he was uh dealing with legal issues concerning whether or not he laundered money to Silk Road vendors and stuff so then what <laughs> But take out two incompetent people and put in another incompetent person who has a questionable history and isn't actually that involved with Bitcoin and is is making his own competing altcoins. It's weird. I don't. It, 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 I think the main lesson that we should just take away from this and that the community should take away from this is that the Bitcoin Foundation isn't actually devoted to Bitcoin itself at all. Like. It's just we shouldn't expect that from them. We should stop expecting that from them. Yeah, they haven't they haven't been devoted to actually improving Bitcoin for a long time. But one one positive thing that I learned about Brock Pierce uh, while I was writing this article was he was in Mighty Ducks, so he has that going for him. Yeah, yeah, and Mighty <laughs> Ducks too as well. Yeah, so you know at least at least he was in you know m- one of my childhood movies. And uh, but other than that, you know, he's super shady, and he apparently doesn't care about his job as you know a promoter of Bitcoin. He cares more about competing with Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay, so um, so f- I, I I published an article today about um, about Andreas Antonopoulos resigning from the Bitcoin Foundation. He 
publicly announced this over Twitter and started a pretty heated argument over Twitter. Uh, Gavin and Andreessen chimed in. Um, John Matonis chimed in, who's the executive director of the Bitcoin Foundation. And Matonis and Andreessen um, were basically trying to defend the foundation from Andreas's um, criticisms, which were that it's too secretive, it's not transparent enough, um, the management doesn't uh, doesn't um, release enough information to people who are involved in the foundation, and also to people who are involved in Bitcoin. Period. So that's why Andreas quit. And uh, in researching that article, I came across some really startling um, statistics concerning the foundation's finances. Um, I looked at their 2013 tax form, which they have posted on their website, and they made over $350,000 from membership dues alone. Yeah. So, like, people who want to join the foundation, there's different levels of, like, of membership they can join as. You know, it ranges from, like, $25 to, you know, thousands of dollars if you're a highly successful Bitcoin startup. And they they make nearly half a million dollars just from those dues alone. Those don't even include other sources of revenue. And, you know, the vast majority of their expenses go towards uh, lobbying the political structure in Washington. And then... The rest of it pretty much goes towards salaries for the employees of the foundation. And um, no, we, we now know that there's very few actual computer scientists and developers who work on the code itself. So the, the majority of the salaries, just that, is, is going towards people like Brock Pierce, John Matonis, um, and, and other executives in the company who don't even improve Bitcoin in any sub substantial way. They're basically like, um, I don't know you, what, what you would call it. They're like figureheads or, you know, just yeah. faces to, to like, they're like leadership roles, but they aren't actually doing anything to improve the code. And I think that people who pay membership dues to the foundation need to wake up and realize that their money isn't actually going towards improving Bitcoin. It's going towards these, these, first of all, gigantic salaries for people like Brock Pierce, who aren't even working on Bitcoin. And secondly, like it's going towards political lobbying. They hired the, the biggest um, or one of the biggest lobbying firms in the United States, Thorson French Advocacy, the same lobbying firm that is used by uh, major pharmaceutical companies, recording industry um, groups, who who use copyright law to attack end users with ridiculous lawsuits and it's like what it, what is the bitcoin foundation doing what people need to realize they need to stop giving these people money they're not they're not spending it wisely that's yeah that's they you know it's been it's been a very long time um since they've actually done anything useful like you know, in the in the past, you know, just like in the past year, um, Coinbase and BitPay have done more, you know, in terms of getting major businesses to accept Bitcoin, yeah. you know, than the Bitcoin Foundation has. And that's, you know, that's like part of their mission statement is to, you know, um, spread the acceptance of Bitcoin, you know, around the world. They're not doing that. Um, they're not giving any funding towards core development so you know we're not going to solve any of the major flaws in the protocol like you know um like the possibility of mining centralization that's not going to happen with the bitcoin foundation and um so what they've been doing for however long is they've been just been hanging out with governments and like basically begging them to act favorably towards Bitcoin, and yeah. so far, in many cases, they haven't been successful in doing that. Yeah. So what are they doing? What are they contributing to improving Bitcoin? How are they making it a better monetary system yeah. that everybody in the world can use? They're not doing it. They're not doing anything. It seems it, like, yeah. I don't know, like, it seems like they, they have this idea that Bitcoin is already finished. Like, it's as good as it's going to get. We don't need to improve it anymore. It's already the best thing ever, the best thing since sliced bread. No one needs to improve it. It's got no issues. And we're, we're, we're done with that. We're just going to 
basically promote it to the United States government and get them to act favorably towards it. What does that even mean? Like, what what concrete, like, like, results do they hope to get from lobbying? Are they trying to get, like, a law passed that requires everyone to use Bitcoin? I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, so like, what are they lobbying for? If, if they're pursuing, if they're pursuing, you know, political action to, you know, get governments to act favorably towards Bitcoin, all they're going to get, you know, is, uh, is legislation out of it. They're just going to get, you know, it might not... It, it won't be if they're successful you know the governments won't ban bitcoin but they'll construct this huge regulatory infrastructure around it and um you know that's basically just going to turn it into another dollar you know <laughs> like mm, it, you know yeah. they're they're going to try to they're going to try to bring it under the control of the central banks which is always a bad thing um you know they're going to they're going to implement regulation that restricts exchange competition so you know mm -hmm. we might uh, inch closer towards an exchange monopoly, which could become another Mt. Gox. Like these are the things that the Bitcoin Foundation is going to accomplish with yeah. their political activism. Yeah, these um, so-called really, good results they want. Yeah, what really needs to be done is improving the core protocol because if they, I, you know, I don't know if the Bitcoin Foundation thinks that Bitcoin is perfect already. You know, I, but if it, if they do assume that, if that's what they believe, um. You know, then why are there six hundred other altcoins? You know, if Bitcoin was perfect, yeah. then there would be no reason to create an altcoin to compete with Bitcoin. So, and I mean, obviously Brock Pierce understands that because he's creating real coin. So, <laughs> yeah. So I just maybe he knows it. something that the rest of the foundation doesn't somehow. Yeah, yeah I just don't <laughs> get it. I don't understand why um, the Bitcoin Foundation t made such a radical change in their focus. Like, you know, they. Yeah they were doing like really good things like they were helping businesses accept bitcoin things mm -hmm. like that you know they're providing like the bitcoin accepted here stickers uh mm. teaching people how to use coinbase uh, or or you know online wallets and things like that mm. but now they're just hanging out you know politicians all the time and now just recently you know a couple of days ago they've hired this huge lobbying firm like they're really yeah. not that much different from um a political action committee anymore, right. you know? Yeah, I think that's basically what they are at this point. I mean, we should start referring to them as that. They're a political action committee. They're a lobbying group. Um, that's what they are. They're just they're the they're, they're they're the political arm of the Bitcoin community, which is like an oxymoron almost because <laughs> so many in the Bitcoin community don't give a shit about corrupt politics. <laughs> But the Bitcoin Foundation, which started out as this really uh, positive group that was doing a lot towards promoting adoption and such, and 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 was actually paying several people to work on the code, and now it's just falling apart. And it's like they're just getting in bed with with politicians and lobbyists and regular regulators, hoping to. I mean, I don't want to sound like too cynical, but it, like maybe they're just hoping to to get favorable le legislation passed that helps their group specifically. Maybe they don't care that much about how Bitcoin overall succeeds and how end users um, get some positive benefit out of it. They're just looking to pad their own pockets and increase their own influence, gain more power for themselves um, with the political establishment in the United States. Well, I mean, they did have Mark Carpolos on the board at some point, you know, so that's not too far-fetched of a theory. Um, but they should be at least somewhat concerned about the end state of Bitcoin because their entire existence is dependent upon it. Hmm. You know, like, let's let's say they are successful and they, they pass all these regulations, you know, but that just sets the precedent for government control over Bitcoin. So, yep. you know, if if they inadvertently get Bitcoin regulated out of existence, then, you know, they're their money supply dries up. Like, they're not going to get paid to promote something that doesn't exist. Like, yeah. And in that case, just... like, if somehow Bitcoin did die because of, like, inadvertent, like, bad regulatory action or something like that, these assholes would just move to a different altcoin and start promoting that to Washington or whatever. You know, it, like, if Bitcoin dies, do you really think that Brock Pierce would have any hesitation at all in basically propping up real coin as the new alternative to Bitcoin that is, you know, more secure, more stable, less volatile, and basically yeah. promoting that to yeah, Washington. 
that wouldn't surprise me at all because Brock Pierce is already going all in with this. You know, like he's been in contact with several different banks mm-hmm. trying to get RealCoin integrated into their ATM system. You know, so if so, like just however long he's been working on this project, he's put more effort into it than he's ever put into Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. like no, no good is going to ever come from the Bitcoin Foundation from this point forward. You know, they're just digging themselves into a hole. Uh, you know, as soon as, as soon as they started hanging out with governments, they started acting like government, mm. and that's just that's going to be their downfall because, um, you know, Bitcoin is not you know some political concept. It's just it's a, it's a monetary. Thing. It's an actual it's, it's a monetary system. system. Yeah, yeah. It, like like whether or not the politicians favor it, there's always going to be people that use it as long as there are people that value it. So they're yeah. really just wasting their time. So, um, so let's like let's kind of go forward thinking a little bit and try and um, talk about ways that we could possibly replace the original function of the Bitcoin Foundation, which was to support Bitcoin, to promote its acceptance, and to fund the infrastructure improvements. Um, so a week ago, uh, Olivier Janssens who is a wealthy uh, digital currency entrepreneur. He put up a $100,000 bounty a couple months ago, and a week ago he announced who would win the bounty for a possible replacement for the Bitcoin Foundation, an open source replacement, decentralized replacement. And the winner was none other than Mike Kern and his decentralized crowdfunding platform, Lighthouse. So um, uh, Mike Kern himself is going to get $40,000 um, once he releases the project open source uh, sometime this summer and another fifty thousand dollars will be donated by Jansen's to the um, to the first crowdfunding project that actually gets off the ground on Lighthouse and uh, promotes decentralized uh, infrastructure and decentralized funding for it and um, you know it shows potential it shows potential that uh, we might not necessarily need the Bitcoin Foundation and their institutional access to actually improve Bitcoin itself. And we can move forward without them, perhaps. Yeah, I think that, I think Lighthouse, you know, if it ends up being successful, it will definitely push funding to the areas in the Bitcoin community that need it the most. Right now, that's, right now, that's development. Um, And so that's, that's most likely where all the funding would go. Uh, But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that Lighthouse is just a platform for getting funding for core development. Mm-hmm. You know, after Bitcoin is perfected, it could still be used as a medium of fundraising for political action, if that's yeah. what people want. Yeah. You know, or anything else is Bitcoin re- related. You know, it's basically just Kickstarter, except you don't have like this centralized, you know, Co- this, company, this centralized basically. control, the centralized company that controls it that takes like what thirty percent of all the donations. <laughs> So and basically chooses who and who can and cannot uh, put up a project for funding and what payment methods can be accepted, uh, you know, and and PayPal freezing funds and all this, all this uh, problems that come along with a centralized funding institution. Yeah, it'll all be done through the blockchain, and uh, you know, so the developers who have the best ideas to improve Bitcoin the best way, they'll get the most money, and you know. They'll get all of the money minus, you know, a, a minimal transaction fee or something yeah. when it goes on the blockchain, yeah. Yeah. and um, and people will actually be able to devote their full time to improving Bitcoin. You know, it's I've said this before, and they'll be accountable time. too, more more so yeah. than people who work for the foundation. Yeah, because it'll be completely transparent, right? They they can't hide. They can't. There's no way of hiding from these people who fund them. And, you know, I said this before in a previous podcast, but uh, Bitcoin has, it's you know, it's not like a weekend warrior thing anymore. You know, you can't do this as a hobby. Right. If you're, if you're going to, if, if, you know, if you're going to commit yourself to solving a problem with the, with the protocol, it's basically a full-time job at this point. You know, Mike Hearn, uh, he quit his full-time job to work on Bitcoin. Yeah, he quit at Google. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we need more people like that. You know, we need people to devote their all of their time 
all you know all of their working hours to making Bitcoin better if we want to see it reach its full potential, which yeah. is you know replacing the existing monetary structure. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I think that some people in the community have this fallacious um, uh, like argument in their in their heads or this fallacious belief that Bitcoin has like already pretty much um, reached its potential in terms of like features and like what it can do and stuff like that and and it's it's already like the digital currency that we can all use in the future but no like the mining centralization is just one issue that has been brought up in the recent months and Mike Hearn knows of a ton of different other different issues you can go read his posts on the Bitcoin Foundation uh, forums as well as on Bitcoin Talk and his own blog, there are tons of 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 uh, projects to do on the core Bitcoin code that isn't getting done because we don't have a way to pay these people to do it. And anyone who thought the Bitcoin Foundation was going to play an important role in paying people to improve the code, uh, you're wrong. It's not going to happen. So we need to find a better decentralized way of doing this. Yeah, Satoshi was definitely a genius. But you know he didn't create a perfect system. Uh, like I remember, right. I remember reading something uh, back when that the whole Newsweek thing happened, where they thought they found him, but that yeah. you know reporters really just making things up. Uh, somebody, somebody who uh, I don't, I can't remember his name, but he was like one of the original people who like worked with Nakamoto directly uh, after after uh, the protocols launch, mm -hmm. and he was like. And he was just talking about how, um, how like obviously Satoshi Nakamoto was really old because he used such an outdating coding style that um, like his coding was just so sloppy that he had that him and uh, his partners had to spend a bunch of time just cleaning up the code and you know making it like readable basically. Mm. Um, so yeah, so you know Satoshi definitely didn't create a perfect system, and it's gonna take a lot of work. Yeah, and. Um, you know, a big part of getting that work done is, you know, paying people what what their work is worth. Yeah, and that's yeah. not it's not happening at all at the Bitcoin Foundation. Yeah, Bitcoin and when it was uh, first when it first came out, it was revolutionary and it, and it blew everyone's minds and it's still blowing people's minds about how we can have a decentralized payment system with no central authority, with low fees, uh, that that basically has a public ledger that's verified by the most powerful computer network the world has ever known. All of that is amazing, but yeah, you're right. It's by no means perfect. It's not even close to perfect. There's tons of improvements that can be made to make it more secure, more useful for people. And yeah, we just need to yeah, pay and, people and what they're worth. And on top on top of all that, you know, um, uh, you know, one thing about Bitcoin that is you know pretty much ignored by you know the bulk of the community, uh, it's you know like. People in the economics communities and intellectual circles, you know, they're still arguing over whether or not Bitcoin is real. <laughs> you know, like we have, we they're have still these, at that stage of yeah, development. Yeah, we we have all these technical problems that are huge, but you know, then at the same time, the majority of people, and these are like, you know, this like these smartest, or they're supposed to be these smartest people. They're supposed to have like the they've got know, their degrees huge, and everything. A huge understanding about economics and the way markets work, you know, but they don't even understand the basics of monetary theory, and um, so yeah, the, it's far from perfect. Um, I mean, I personally think it's pretty amazing already, but I also recognize that it's nowhere near being completed. Uh, it's nowhere near being at a stage where it can reach its full potential, and um, so I don't, I don't like it when I see people who talk about it like it's already perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's just you know it's not, and if you know if somebody's popular enough, uh, and they have enough of a following, and they say it's perfect, then they're going to influence everybody, mm -hmm. and you know people aren't going to be as worried about solving the problems anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess, I don't know, like, that's kind of, like, what the attitude of the Bitcoin Foundation board members must have is, like, it's great already, it's it's maybe not perfect, but it's fantastic, and we just need to promote it to people, but no, but no, yeah, you're right, you're completely right, we need to, we need to, um, find, um, uh, we need to fund these people better and give them actual salaries for their work, 
and improve there's still work that needs to be done basically we're not done yet this is only 2014 bitcoin has only been out for around five years a little over five years and uh we're we're still at the early stages of this new financial revolution there's still plenty of work that needs to be done and at the end of the day this is a this is a computer science issue we need computer scientists to work on this to improve it that's who satoshi nakamoto was that's who all of the important um people working on this project and actually doing improvements are um I think I think that the computer scientists working on this project should get paid by far the most, more than any, you know, executive directors at some lobbying group should be, you know? Yeah, I want to see developers, you know, if they do a good job, you know, I want to see them get rich off of this. Yeah. Cuz yeah. you know, they would be they would be doing a huge service to, you know, to people like me who have, you know, they, I, like I don't have the slightest clue about how to solve, you know, the the mining centralization problem yeah, yeah. by, you know, modifying the, the core protocol. Like, so you know, these people. We kind of put our trust in them in a way, right? Yeah, kind of trust them to do it. It's it's a really specialized skill set, uh, and only a handful of people can do it. So, you know, so they they definitely should be rewarded for their efforts. You know, and they you know they need an. They need to know that they can be rewarded, so they have an incentive to actually work on it, which is the mm -hmm. problem right now. Nobody wants to do anything because it's such a huge task, and nobody wants to pay them anything for it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Lighthouse. Hopefully, that makes a dent in this problem. And um, I like for for any uh, Bitcoin business people from Bitcoin businesses who might be watching this right now. I just, I just want to plead with you just a little bit, like, like just, just, just stop paying membership dues to the Bitcoin Foundation. You know, it's, they aren't, they aren't doing anything productive with that money. Save that money, and 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 invest it in actual projects on Lighthouse in the future that you can um, directly fund the projects that you specifically want to see get finished. Projects that the rest of the community agrees would help to improve Bitcoin. And in, in that way, you can have a very targeted effort to fund specific improvements and also have a way to hold the, um, the, the project uh, doers accountable for what they're working on. Um, if, if someone raises funding for a project and then doesn't execute it, like no one's going to fund them anymore. Um, so, but, but like all these dynamics we don't see any of this happening at all in the bitcoin foundation we don't we can't, we don't know who's working on what unless we hear uh hearsay from people like mike hearn or or gavin andreessen about what they're working on and we also don't know much, how much they're getting paid for their work it seems like the foundation just pays them like a a, a yearly salary and we don't we don't know like if that includes funding for all the projects they're working on or if the foundation wants them to work on certain things or if they're even telling them what to work on at all you, you know it's 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 just completely um it's completely opaque and uh that that goes back to why Andreas Antonopoulos um resigned they're just they're just uh there's no accountability basically in the bitcoin foundation yeah, I think the best way for these companies to promote Bitcoin is, you know, to not give their money to the Bitcoin Foundation, but to directly fund people to work on development and to offer salary options for their employees in Bitcoin. That would be, you know, the best thing that companies like Overstock could do to promote the development and acceptance of Bitcoin. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Overstock, BitPay, Coinbase, BitGo. I mean, there's a whole list of them. If you go to the Bitcoin Foundation website, you can you can see the gigantic list of industry industry groups and companies that are literally paying members of of the foundation. And I just wanna I just wanna plead with them to like, you know, you know, re rethink your strategy of trying to improve Bitcoin. You know, it's great that they're making money off it, but if they want to keep making money off it and if they want to stay in business with Bitcoin as a successful digital currency, we're gonna to have to find better ways of actually improving the core code. So hopefully um, Lighthouse yeah. will be it. Yeah, hopefully, definitely. Um, so 
I think that pretty much covers it about the uh, Bitcoin Foundation talk. Um, this is an ongoing story that's still evolving. Andreas hasn't revealed specifically why he left. He just says general management issues and lack of transparency. So that's still developing. There's a good chance we'll talk about it next week on the podcast as well if anything new happens. Um, but I want to switch over to um, another topic that I talked, I did an article about a few days ago, which was that a uh, intrepid Bitcoiner in San Francisco has started um, hiding little aluminum uh, Bitcoin wallets around the city worth uh, just 20, bu 20 bucks each, but he's tweeting the clues about their locations to Twitter followers and kind of sending San Francisco people on a treasure hunt for digital currency. I think that's just hilarious. <laughs> like, that just sounds like a fun thing to do. I would uh -huh. do that if I had the money. Yeah, I've, I've actually thought about doing something like that before. But, like, I mean... Yeah, I don't. I don't really have the money to do that. I'm not. I'm not rich with bitcoins or anything. I mean, I'm lucky to have a job that pays me in bitcoin. Yeah. But it's not making me rich by any means. But you know, I thought about doing that. But another issue is like this guy who's in San Francisco doing this. Like he makes these really nice looking aluminum cards that have the public key, the private key. Um, it's got his Twitter username on it, and it's got like a a link. Um, to a website that'll teach people how to use Bitcoin, you know. So in case someone finds it who doesn't, who has never heard of Bitcoin before, it's got a link there where they can go online and, and learn about how to, you know, redeem the wallet and start using the digital currency. So I think it's I think it's pretty um, interesting how you know it's an interesting way to promote adoption um, and acceptance to random people, you know. Yeah, it's just it's a fun thing to do too, like. It kind of reminds me of geocaching. Yeah. You yeah. know, except with, you know, money, something have, people can actually use. Have you been geocaching before? Have you gone searching for that kind of stuff? No, I've just, you know, I've just heard about it. Yeah, I've and tried. Pretty much I've it. actually tried going geocaching before. Like, I, I, pull, I downloaded an app on my phone and, like, uh, searched for locations around my area for people who have set things down. And, um... And, like, I didn't actually find anything that was worth anything. The, the, the only substantial thing that I found in my geocache hunt was, like, a little piece of paper with everyone's name signed on it who <laughs> found that little thing. So I didn't find any, like, money or anything awesome like that. And certainly no yeah. Bitcoins. But, yeah, like, it's um, um, uh, SF Hidden Bitcoin doing doing good stuff it's 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 a new twist on geocaching like it's actually it's worth something you know i think that the new sf hidden bitcoin thing hiding hiding bitcoin aluminum wallets around san francisco is better in some ways than the original hidden cash which was uh the the rich guy hiding dollars and 20s and in, in envelopes around the city and then tweeting clues to it I'm biased because I'm involved in Bitcoin, so <laughs> I, I, I like I like the the Bitcoin one better than the regular cash one because it's promoting Bitcoin acceptance and it's just a really fun idea. And he's really doing it well too with those really nicely made aluminum cards. So I think it's it's really exciting. And I like I back, I live in San Jose, so San Francisco is just like a 60 minute drive away from me, or like a two hour um, ride in the on on Bart. And I've considered like going up there and looking for these things, you know, <laughs> joining the hunt. But then yeah. I'm like, uh, like it's it's only twenty dollars per wallet, and uh, you know, just driving up there would probably cost twenty bucks in <laughs> gas. So I'm like, um, if I lived in San Francisco, I would definitely go do it. But you know, I think for now, I'll just I'll just watch afar from Twitter and watch these people get it. Yeah, it looks pretty fun. I wish somebody would do that in my area, but. I seem to be the only person I know in my town that even knows what Bitcoin is. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you were, if you were to do this, like you would probably spread adoption a little bit, spread acceptance or something. But um, you wouldn't like you wouldn't get a lot of people like going out to search to search for it, you know, because no one really knows about Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, the most likely case would be somebody would pick it up. And like throw it in the trash because they thought it was litter or something. <laughs> yeah, you're like, what? What is this? What's a little, 
a piece of paper with a QR code on it. What, the, what piece of junk? I don't want to go to your stupid QR website and promoting this Bitcoin company thingy. Psh, throw away. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's tough living out in the country. Just a bunch of rednecks. <laughs> hey, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, maybe in the future, maybe in the future, though, like uh, as Bitcoin gets more widely accepted, give, give it a few years, you'll... You'll get a few Bitcoiners, redneck Bitcoiners out in the country, you know? Yeah, Give I think it'd be time. cool. I think it'd be cool if you could just, like, go to a farm or somewhere and buy, like, you know, like, a sack of corn for 20 bucks in Bitcoin. <laughs> a sack he's of got corn. A giant, he's got a giant QR code on his barn. Yeah. <laughs> or a couple of chickens. <laughs> he, like, brands the chickens with the QR code seek. <laughs> So you can so you can scan it and pay in bitcoins for some chickens and you know and cow and mm, yeah. yeah that we would officially be in the future when you can do that yeah yep hey it's gonna happen I'm telling you just give it some time <laughs> you'll be able to buy chickens with bitcoin <laughs> <sighs> okay so um yeah SF hidden bitcoin good stuff keep keep hiding he's doing it throughout the entire uh, month of July. Um, every day in July, uh, $20 wallet. So if you live, hey, viewers of the Coin Brief podcast, if you live in or near San Francisco, like go go do this. It's fun. Like if you have a day to spare, go um, search for the search for the wallet. Follow the clues. I tried deciphering some of the clues myself. I don't really get those riddles. Even if I lived <laughs> in San Francisco, I probably wouldn't be able to find this thing. It's a big city too. But yeah, if you live near there, if you if you're confident in finding out what the clues mean, go for it. It's probably fun. Make a free, make an extra twenty bucks for your for your scavenger hunting efforts. So, um, let's uh, let's move on. Um, you think that you, do you think the floor is about six hundred at this point? Do you think we'll go lower than that? No, I don't think we'll go lower than six hundred. And the last price analysis I did, um, I said that I believe that the price floor could be anywhere between 600 and 650. Obviously, it's not 650. Um, I thought for I thought for a brief minute that it might be 620, but then today it went below that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's hard to predict, it's right? It's hard. It's hard to determine price floors. Because, um, you know, it's not – a price floor isn't really a concrete thing. Like what a, what I consider a price floor to be is just the bottom point of a trend. You know, like you, like if it goes below a certain point, then the trend is effectively over and we've established a new trend. Uh -huh. um, but it's hard to determine what that is because if you look at it as like, well, if it gets to this certain point, and then it stays like that for like a week, and then it um, and then it goes up, and it doesn't you know go down past that point until like some really bad news. Like, is if you say that's a price floor, I say is that really a price floor, or is it just you know a little bit of sideways action, which means you know the price was stagnant, it didn't move. Right. Um. So when I talk about price floors, I'm pretty much just speculating, and I don't really put. A lot of weight into it when I do analysis, just because they're so uh, like they're just so they're so hard to track and establish that um, mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think using price floors is a really good analytical tool. I think I rather would rather focus on watching trends. Yeah, and and like another thing with with Bitcoin is negative news a lot of the time can come out of nowhere and hit people by surprise. And this Bitcoin foundation drama that has been happening this week, um, it's not that heated yet, but it's possible it could get worse if more people resign from the foundation over transparency issues. But, you know, those kind of headlines showing up, that could inspire, you know, speculators to sell on that news. And then all of a sudden, you've got a lower floor than you anticipated. And... And, and it was caused by, you know, ineptitude and stupidity at the foundation. Yeah, realistically, um, in terms of, you know, 
trend analysis and the future of Bitcoin price, if you want to be really safe when you're talking about a price floor, um, I would say the price floor is $430 because um, we're still, um, in my opinion, we haven't, the Silk Road thing didn't establish a new trend. It was just created a slight divergence from the upward trend that was established like in May, in early May. Yes. And at that point, the clear price floor was between 430 and 450. Yes. And so, in terms of that, we've gone nowhere but up. So, if, like I said, if you want to be really safe while talking about price floors, I would say since we're still in the same trend that we've been in since May, I would say 430 to 450. That makes sense. But, um, yeah. But, you know, in terms of trying trying to determine a, a price floor, uh, a new like short term price floor that's that was established because of the auction, um, I don't know if you could even do that. It's been really hard so far. Uh, I've I've still been right so far. The price is still between six hundred and six fifty, but um, but the you know the auction just created a huge amount of excitement. It made the price go up to six hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, where previously it was at what 560, 570 or something like that. Yeah. And um, you know, so as you know, that that excitement is obviously wearing down because the price is at 617 right now. Um, you know, there's no telling where it could go. Like it, it could bottom out at 600, or it could go back to, you know, the, you know, the excitement could completely die out and go back all the way back down to 560 again. You know, who knows? Right. Right. So you're basically saying that uh, we we kind of like reached the floor already uh, around early May, around the the 430, 450 range, and since then we've made a lot of progress um, in in terms of uh, price movement, and it's pro it's not going to go below that unless something truly truly catastrophic happens. Uh, you know, Ghash.io commits a double spend attack, just just speculation. You know, something horrible like that. That's the only thing that could drive the price even lower than 430. Let's say, right? Yeah, I think, I think no matter what, um, you know, like no matter what happens, except for you know some huge like cataclysmic event, um, it will not go under four hundred and thirty dollars. And if it does, we've established a new trend, and it's a downward trend. But um, you know, trying to determine a, a price floor like post Silk Road auction, it's really just, it's really just speculation saying like um. Like I don't think, I think the Silk Road auction generated enough excitement that enough people got in and are holding on for the long run, and so I, I don't think that the price will go below six hundred as long as the stream of good news continues. But mm -hmm. if we enter the possibility of bad news into the equation, um, then it very well could go below six hundred, but. As long as we stay above 430, I would say we're in the same upward trend. It was just, you know, a slight, a slight divergence yeah. because of bad news. Yeah, and then you've got, uh, you know, huge venture capitalists making predictions like it will hit $2,000 by the end of the year. Um, I'm looking at this story uh, from the Telegraph that was submitted to Reddit. Um, this venture capitalist named Jeff Lewis predicted at the Coin Summit in London that Bitcoin will hit $2,000 by the end of the year. So, you know, of course, you've still got the people who are very, very bullish, um, even in the, in the short term. Um, we're already halfway through the year, and to hit 2000 by the end of the year, that's pretty bullish, don't, don't you think? You, you think, do you think? Do you think, do you agree that that's possible, 2000 uh, well, by the I'm end of the year? I'm very bullish on the future of of Bitcoin price, I wouldn't be surprised at a thousand. But for them to say two thousand, they must know something that I don't. You know, mm. they must be getting ready to do something really huge that nobody knows about. Mm. Um, because I don't really know where they get the numbers from. Like, I think one thousand is a reasonable prediction because um, it you know it would go along with the gradual uptrend that we've seen since May. Right. Uh, because you know there hasn't been. Like there's there's been you know brief spikes in the price where it's jumped up like a hundred dollars in a couple of days, but you know between May and July 10th is today's date, 
it's really been, you know, steady, gradual growth from 430 up to, you know, 617. Yeah, yeah. And so, and also, you know, we've been above 1,000 before, as most people know, late last year. So that wouldn't that wouldn't surprise that many people to see us go over it again this year. Yeah, and I think, um, I think, I actually said this in one of my very first price analyses that I did. Um, I think that once it gets above 1,000, there will be a pretty big sell-off because there's a bunch of people who uh, – took a big hit because they bought in at a thousand yeah and or i would say or 700 and such i would i would say that those people are pretty fed up with bitcoin and once they get a chance to break even or get a small return on investment they're gonna sell so once mm. it hits a thousand it could go back down a few hundred dollars easily just because of that just because of the fact that there are people who took huge losses in uh november and december yeah, and um, yeah. so that's a definite possibility. I think that's a likelihood. Um, but after that happens, I see no reason why it wouldn't continue to go up. After that, it's to the moon, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so we are almost done with this, but I want to hit one more topic uh, for this podcast. Um, I just saw this story on the Bitcoin subreddit. It's at the top right now. It was submitted four hours ago. There is a brand new decentralized and anonymous marketplace that has been released uh, on Bitcoin Talk and GitHub. Um, I just saw this a moment ago, and at first I thought it was going to be the Open Bazaar, which has been in development for a while. But this is actually something completely different. It's... Um, Here's, here's some of the details. I'll list them right now. It's decentralized with no central servers. Um, it, it uses BitMessage as a transportation medium, um, which is uh, secure and encrypted. Uh, the NSA won't be able to read that those messages. There is a public channel for offers and then messages for direct communication. It uses Bitcoin for payments, of course. They use uh, three different multi-signature multi addresses one for payment and two for insurance payments so um that that that'll make um transactions very secure between uh buyers and vendors and then uh buyers and sellers both send 5% of the sum to one multi-signature address and both have an incentive to be honest and stick to their side of the deal and after the buyer receives the goods all three payments from the addresses are released 5% back to the buyer and payment goes to the seller and then 5% also go, goes back to the seller. So it kind of like puts a little bit of collateral uh, from each person into the pool so that nobody um, wants to kind of, you know, rip off the other person. So uh, I, I haven't read that much into this. this. This just came out, but I think it's fascinating. This is great. We've got, we've got multiple decentralized anonymous marketplaces in the works. Not just open bazaar. That's great news. Yeah, creating creating you know 100% decentralized marketplaces. I would consider that to be the next step in peer-to-peer -peer technology, uh, and that would you know make it even harder for authorities to enforce you know the war on drugs or whatever war they're waging on consumers' goods at yes, the moment. Yes. Yes. Because you know Tor Tor is great and everything. You know Darknet is great and everything. Um, it's it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, but you know the enterprises uh, operating on uh, operating on the Tor network, you know they're completely centralized. Um, yes, and that's what happened know, to Silk Road. That's yeah, why they were you know, able to they, seize they those. Yeah, they they have they use they have servers and things like that, and they have you know administrators and proprietors, and um, you know that's how people get caught, and that's how you know the government will eventually defeat Bitcoin if they ever do. Because they're never going to be able to defeat Bitcoin as a currency, but they can make it impossible to use by, you know, uh, by, you know, tightening their restrictions on what kinds of money can be accepted and in, uh, in marketplaces. So if you if you have something like this, like Open Bazaar and this, you know, one that was just uh, released on GitHub, you know, governments can't even do that. You know, they can't even regulate 
the point of sale anymore and that's pretty amazing yeah i mean we this is the, yeah you're right i think this is the next evolution of you know this peer-to-peer -peer technology and how it can revolutionize the economy like first we got bitcoin decentralized payment system but then we got all these marketplaces that use bitcoin but they all have central points of failure they have actual human beings operating them and running important things related to the marketplaces. And if you take those people out of the equation, if they do something bad, if they get arrested, if if they run run away with everyone's money, like this is <laughs> human beings are are incredibly incredibly flawed, and that's why a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure is almost always infinitely better than having a you know a hierarchy of humans who. Um, who can be taken out of the equation and the whole marketplace fails. So this is fan this is fantastic news. I love it. It's called um it's called BitXBay. That's what it's called and um and you know hopefully it gains some traction. You will with pretty soon we'll have competing decentralized marketplaces and we'll find out which one uh successfully revolutionizes the marketplace formula and makes it immune to attacks by the government and also immune to um, bad actors within the marketplace itself. Yeah, I hope we see things like decentralized exchanges and decentralized banks too in the near future. Yeah, that would be really great. Because, you know, then we couldn't have another Mount Gox, even if somebody tried, you know, deliberately to steal people's money like that. And um, a problem a lot of people in the Bitcoin community have been running into is that banks actually you know shut down your account if you're using bitcoin like if you have money coming in from a bitcoin exchange they'll shut your account down because you know they'll claim you know money laundering risks or something like that right, right. and it's really because they just don't like bitcoin they don't you know, trust it they don't understand yeah. it and so once if if we could if we start seeing things like decentralized exchanges and decentralized banks you know, then that would be a sign of, you know, a really strong financial infrastructure being built around the Bitcoin monetary system itself. And that that can do nothing but good because it will only make Bitcoin more secure and safer to use. Yeah, and it'll also do tons of great, great progress towards um, promoting freedom for people, um, promoting free market ideals, allowing people to transact um, in any way they please, sell anything they want, buy anything they want, without asking permission from anyone. Literally, you pretty soon, you won't even need permission from the marketplace itself to sell something or buy something on there. It'll be like, it'll be kind of like an autonomous um, network that doesn't rely on any particular human being to to give permission to anyone to use it. It'll just exist by itself for the public to use freely. Yeah, and that would make, you know, that would make exchange completely voluntary, like 100%. You know, like, um, because as long as there's a demand, there'll be somebody who can fill it without having to worry about being shut down by somebody who has different morals or, you know, like, you know, competing yeah. in a separate industry or something like that. Um, and, you know, that would be really great for the economy in, in general because that would just produce, you know, a bunch of growth yeah. and a lot of job opportunities. You know, if we had a, like a purely decentralized economy, you know, people could make a living, you know, with their laptops at home. Yep. And they, they wouldn't have to rely on, uh, you know, giant corporations and things like that. Yeah, no, or having to have... get in their gas-guzzling car and drive to some big building where they sit at a desk and do paperwork all day. You can do plenty of fantastic work directly th through the Internet. Yeah, no, of course, I don't I don't have a problem with centralized corporations and, and private enterprises like that. As long as they're profitable, you know, then they're good, and we should have them. But I think... I think that this type of decentralization will end up being more profitable than, you know, the the hierarchy, the hierarchical structure of yeah. corporation. Yeah, it'll be more profitable and more beneficial to the regular people themselves, if you know what I mean. Like it, it corporations and big large institutions like 
they often do great for the people who uh, work within them and the people who get salaries from that particular corporation and such. But if you really want to improve the lives of regular people who don't necessarily have like um, ha have a monetary and financial interest in a particular corporation, then then decentralized is the way to go. It's the way to go, and it's it'll be re reliable too. Yeah, yeah. and. I mean, the th actually, like, what a corporation is has just been so diluted by governments, anyways, that um, it's really hard to actually make a free market argument for corporations in their current state. Mm. You know, but if a corporation, like you know, just a regular corporation that we have now, if on a purely free market, as long as it's profitable, we should have it because you know they're providing a valuable service, obviously because they're making money. Um, not that, necessarily. I I would I would oh, take issue you, with that what, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, What's your counter argument? Okay. Um. So so you're saying that corporations, um, if they make money, then then that's great. Then then they deserve to exist, and they're if they make money, then they provide value to people, basically, right? But that's yeah. not necessarily the case because so many large corporations in the in the United States today, they only make money or a large portion of their profits are just because they're so in bed and so close with government if you know what i mean like like they they get no, so yeah, much that's, kickbacks that's from I'm taxes saying. and stuff and that that is not because they're providing any extra value to the regular people it's just because they <laughs> they they've got connections to the government which controls all the money yeah that's what i'm saying like the actual definition of what a corporation is has been so diluted uh, by government regulation and just you know cronyism and things like that, uh, that it's hard to make a free market argument for corporations as they exist today. What I'm saying is, on a purely free market, uh, with with no government intervention or possibly you know no government at all, it does you know it doesn't really matter. Um, on a purely free market, anything, any business, any enterprise that is making a profit. Is ha like is necessarily providing value to society because on a free market they wouldn't be making money if people didn't want what they were selling because the only way they can make it the only way they can make profit is mm. by getting people to buy their products. Mm. Do you do you think that the like sometimes with okay I, I'll, I'll give a specific example um, like with the energy industry we've got these oil corporations which make tons and tons of money um, by selling oil and gasoline. Uh, oil is used to make plastics. It's ridiculous. Like it, it, it basically runs a large part of the economy. So they make a lot of money off of that. But do you, like the only reason people still buy gasoline or some people still buy gasoline is because it's the only option out there. We don't, we don't have a system yet where um, electric cars are really supported in the overall economy. We don't have a system where um, hybrid cars, cars are really supported. So these, these oil corporations have basically um, gotten so intertwined with the government and regulators where they, they, they are given a de facto monopoly in the energy industry, right? And, and like, it's, it's not really a free market so you, c you can't say that they're providing value to people in the free market because people are buying it well if it's the only thing to buy then people don't really have a choice right right yeah but i would i would blame that on government again though um i could i okay, could talk yeah. about the history of oil corporations all day you know like the closest thing to a free market the united states ever had was in the 19th century uh after the civil war it, it, the gilded age and um, we had Standard Oil. It was it ended up being it ended up being a monopoly, um, but that's because uh, there's just a sheer lack of physical space in, on the earth to have multiple competing oil companies because there's only so much oil, right? And then what happened there was that um, they actually uh, Rockefeller actually um, he actually provided a lot of value to society. Uh, he actually he helped the environment a lot uh, because of his enterprises, and yeah. he decreased the price of oil constantly. Now, what happened was that's the, how he the gained his monopoly, right? He yeah, was so low. Yeah, the government 
the government then broke up the monopoly. They split it into, you know, the, the baby corporations, which were then, most of those were completely bought up by foreign oil companies. And these were companies like Shell, uh, British Petroleum, uh, you know, companies like that. And so the U.S. government, by breaking up standard oil monopoly, they basically set the stage for what we have today, where we have like three or four major oil companies, mm -hmm. and those th and those few those handful of companies, they're currently controlled by OPEC, which is you know a handful of really rich Middle Eastern states that are rich in oil production, and um, so the whole the whole system around oil production that we have today is completely a product of government. And the reason why it isn't going away is that governments are so invested in it. You know, in the United States, mm -hmm. we rely on the gas tax to build our roads and things like that. So if, mm -hmm. if the government allowed private enterprise to develop an alternative to um, a fuel-driven engine, they would lose all funding. Uh, they would lose all funding from their gas tax. And then, you know, apparently there would be no roads because nobody else other than government knows how to build a road. Um, yeah, how do you do that anyway? But, you know, but, you lay down a mat or something. <laughs> so gov governments created the situation we have today with oil and energy in general, and they profit too much from keeping it around. So they're not going to let any alternative energy hit the market unless it unless they approve it, and they would only approve it if it doesn't threaten the oil industry. You know, mm -hmm. that's why we have things like what happened with Solyndra where the the United States federal government put like two billion dollars, I think, gave like two billion dollars in subsidies to Solyndra, which was this solar panel manufacturing company. Um, but you know, solar panels aren't the most efficient, you know, method of creating alternative energy. Mm -hmm. Wasn't as successful as the federal government thought it would be. Solyndra tanked. They went bankrupt. Taxpayers were out two billion dollars, and it did nothing in the way of green energy um yeah so yeah i would <laughs> you're, I you're would more say... likely to to create a solution to the energy problem by deregulating um doing okay hold on like i hate when people bring up the word deregulation because a, lo a lot of so-called republicans don't even know what <laughs> they mean when they talk about deregulation right. when they talk about deregulation what they really mean is they want to deregulate uh, the the largest corporations who already have a lot of power and give them even more permissions to basically run rampant over um, over the population, but like if we had real deregulation, we would see more startups being being able to be formed. Um, there would be less legal overhead for these companies to get started. There would be less concerns about which laws they're breaking and trying to get started in their business and such. So, yeah, I, it's it's if we if we just deregulated did de did real deregulation, then we'd probably see some actual progress get made in the energy industry. Yeah, I would I would be willing to go as far as to argue that. If the United States government had never broken up the standard oil monopoly, that we would already be transitioning to an alternative form of energy as a replacement to oil. Um, you know, because I'm I'm not going to get into like economics, like an in-depth economic uh, argument about standard oil or anything like that. Uh -huh. But breaking it up into all these smaller companies. Uh, made it much easier for the foreign companies to buy them out, which made them bigger. Mm. And then, um, you know, then obviously governments took over the oil companies completely. So, so yeah, if we had never broken up Standard Oil, I think somebody would have came up with some kind of uh, alternative form of energy that would have replaced oil by now. And we would at least be transitioning to it already. And just as a side note, I think it's a pretty cool fact. Uh, I read somewhere that if Standard Oil was never broken up, it would be worth around $1 trillion today. That's a lot. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my rant about free markets and yeah. government intervention in the energy industry. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, I, I'm not that informed about about energy, um, the energy industry. I was just bringing that up as as an example of how uh, you know large companies use their influence in government to basically uh, create um, a, a near monopoly for themselves. But you know, it's it's a it's a real issue. It's a real issue. I think that Republicans have a point when they talk about regulation killing businesses and the economy but they just don't have any actual real solutions to it and the things they do propose would actually just serve to make the problem worse so um yeah anyone watching this who ascribes to who listens to republicans and thinks they're actually going to deregulate uh the economy and make things better um you know look at look at that with uh with take that with a grain of salt look at that with more um more critical thinking, perhaps. Yeah, the you know the establishment Republicans' idea of free markets and deregula and deregulation, or things like uh, like pollution licenses, where the highest bidder gets to pollute yes. the most, and yeah. things like that. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Oh my God! Pay to play, money, money buys influence, and uh... yeah, like if if we had a real a real free market on the environment, you know. Pollution just wouldn't even be a question, you know. If it was treated as a property issue, and not a legal and financial issue, you know, mm. it would it would be solved already. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, that's that's a whole nother can yeah. of worms, and we're just a couple of crypto correspondents who <laughs> talk about cryptocurrencies, <laughs> including Bitcoin. So that uh pretty much does it for this week's edition of the Coin Brief podcast. This has been episode seven. I'm your host, Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Faggard. And um, we will be ne back next week with the latest developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. And hopefully the Bitcoin Foundation starts making some better decisions <laughs> about where they place their money. Hopefully they'll go out of business. <laughs> or at least <laughs> just become irrelevant and stop taking everyone's money and putting it in towards problems in the... I don't know. Yeah, just foundation, just stop. Just stop. Just stop. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you guys next week. See ya.